A difference of languages in Cameroon turns violent. English speakers are demanding an end to what they say is discrimination by the French-speaking majority. Some are even calling for independence. So what does this mean for Cameroon's unity? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Elizabeth Paradam. Secession. It's been the talk of the week from the Kurdish region of Iraq to Catalonia in Spain. And on Sunday, English-speaking parts of Cameroon joined the trend by demanding their own independence. Police shot and killed at least eight people in the western regions of the country. Power was also cut and remains out. The rallies took place on the very day Cameroon's English and French regions had united 56 years earlier. There have been protests like this for nearly a year, but until recently, they had only called for reforms. Cameroon's English-speaking minority say they're being marginalised by the French-speaking majority. Well, the government has been criticised for its lack of response to months of protests, but President Paul Beer responded to Sunday's protests, saying, Let me make this very clear. It's not forbidden to voice any concerns in the Republic. However, nothing great can be achieved by using verbal excesses, street violence and defying authority. Lasting solutions to problems uh, can be found only through peaceful dialogue. But critics of the government say it's shunned dialogue throughout this conflict, allowing it to grow and escalate. We'll get to our guests in just a moment, but first, Mohammed El Bardisi has this report. They have a national anthem, their own flag, and a leader in waiting. All the trappings of a potential new country, but without any land. Because what these people want to call Ambazonia is at the moment the English-speaking part of Cameroon. It's here that demonstrators have gathered momentum in the last year by saying that people suffer discrimination at the hands of the French-speaking government. Most people just want reform, but calls for outright independence are getting louder. We are Ambazonas. We don't need anything again. The only, thing that, the only solution to the matter is let the government solve this problem by giving our independent freedom. At the end of the First World War, Cameroon was divided between the French and the British. At its independence in 1961, the English-speaking opted to join the French Cameroon instead of neighboring Nigeria. These protests have been mainly peaceful, but Cameroon's security forces have cracked down. Six protesters were shot dead last year and hundreds arrested. In an apparent gesture of reconciliation, President Paul Bia ordered that the charges be dropped against several detainees. But that doesn't seem to have calmed the tensions. The man who leads the separatists has been touring the U.S. calling for a peaceful uprising. We call for a non-violent revolution. We call for a non-violent protest. We call for a non-violent march. This is what we are demonstrating to the world, and we have resisted Mr. Beer's army of occupation in our land, but this is a moment that we must continue to stand firm. The U.N. Secretary General has asked Cameroon's government to address the grievances of the English speakers. But the UN is unlikely to answer Mr. Taba's prayers for a new country called Ambazonia. Mohamed El Bardisi, Al Jazeera. We'll talk to our guests in a moment, but first we're joined on the line from Cameroon's capital, Yaoundé, by the former minister, uh, Dr. Elvis Angole. Angole. Dr. Angole, just how worried should the government be right now by the calls uh, for an independent Ambazonia? I'm, I'm not, uh, as a citizen of Cameroon and an English-speaking citizen, uh, it's concerning that uh, there are some people referring to themselves as Ambazonians. As far as I'm concerned, I'm English-speaking, but I, 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 don't, I don't identify with the concept of Ambazonia. And I think that while the concept of Ambazonia is, um, is an opinion by certain or some English-speaking persons, uh, I'm not one of those who identifies with that, and I think that it is um, the wrong opinion. It is an opinion or a point of view which is against the constitution of Cameroon. It is an opinion and a movement which is against uh, the United Nations Charter and the, United, the work of the United Nations. And I think it is an opinion which is against the collective will and the collective conscience of all the people of Cameroon 
in general and the majority of English-speaking Cameroonians in particular. But we are seeing protests calling for an independent Amazonia from some people. And there are those who say that it would never have got this far if their uh, grievances over being marginalized, over being disadvantaged for speaking English were addressed. Right now, we are seeing the killing of protesters and the shutting down of internet services. Why has the government responded this way to these grievances? Uh, the first thing is that um, there's only one independence in Cameroon. And that independence, you know, and everyone knows, and the United Nations has registered it. Cameroon does not have two independence dates. And any group of Cameroonians, be they English-speaking or French-speaking or whatever, they cannot claim that they have another independence date. That will be tantamount to, to a rebellion against the republic and against established laws. But as far as the... the as far as the grievances that have been raised by some uh, because they feel marginalized, you know as much as I know, or as well as I know, that yes, people are right to have grievances. I think it's legitimate to have grievances. Whether the grievances are based on marginalization or, or, uh, or feelings of uh, injustice or lack of equity or whatever, it is normal and, and legitimate for people to have grievances. But what do you do with grievances when you have them? I think that you channel the grievances within the framework of the law, within the framework of the values of the Republic, and uh, in conformity with both national and international norms. In the present case, the case of the, those who want to have what they call their independence. And Dr. Angoli, you're just about to meet with the Prime Minister. What are you going to be discussing? What should he be addressing right now? Well, we are always having meetings because as citizens who are concerned and who have concerns, we have meetings at all levels. Look, I'm just back from uh, one of uh, our, of the, from the southwest region, which is one of the, one of the two English-speaking regions, the ten regions of Cameroon. And we've always had meetings at all levels with all kinds of people. And uh, these meetings are to discuss with our compatriots, fellow compatriots, as to the, the questions and the problems of the day, including those who think that they have a reason to, 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 to succeed. I believe that uh, the meetings we're having in Yaoundé or out of Yaoundé are all meetings intended to reinforce our union and our unity, to reinforce our, 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 our sense of belonging and living together, and to make sure that if there are any uh, divergences of opinions, we try to talk with each other in order to find some common ground and in order to help the government and accompany the government in finding durable solutions to the questions and the problems raised. All right, Dr. Yeah, Ngole. As as... We thank you very much yeah. for your time, Dr. Ngole. We appreciate it very much. Thank you for your time, Elvis Angole, joining us from Yaoundé. Well, let's bring in our panel now in Nairobi, Anz de Marie Ongu, who is Cameroon analyst at the International Crisis Group. Joining us on Skype from Budapest, Albert Chinder, who's a political blogger focusing on Cameroon, and in London, Michael Amoa, associate of the Africa International Affairs Program at the London School of Economics. Welcome to you uh, all. Mr. Achinda, Anglophones were out on the streets on Sunday, some of them calling for an independent Ambazonia. Just how realistic is that, given that decades of calls for greater um, autonomy haven't resulted in anything? Well, and I think the calls for secession by the majority of people on the streets yesterday in Cameroon is legitimate, I could say, but it's not a realistic solution to the problem. It's legitimate because the government has promoted this because the reaction from the government has been brutal, it has been repression, it has been avoiding dialogue, and it has been arresting and detaining most of the leaders. So I think it's very, very legitimate because the content of marginalization by the Anglophone community is very, very real. And I think the government is supposed to come back to dialogue on this. I think it is not late for everybody to come back on the stance of federalism, which was the, the first demand by the Anglophone community when this protest broke out last year. I think the demand for federalism is still legit and it's the best viable solution for us to return to a dialogue table 
with a neutral third party, probably the UN, the African Union or ECOWAS, to mediate on this, because the government cannot mediate on this crisis when they have been the first people, the first people responsible for the escalation. So they can't be the judge or the mediator for the same crisis they caused. Uh, Mr. Amon, let me bring you in now. Uh, what have you made of the government response to the latest protests, not dissimilar to their response to protests earlier this year? And is there the, the, are the conditions on the ground? Do they exist now for talk of federalism uh, when that hasn't happened in decades? Well, I think... Um... The difficulty that the, the, the secessionist movement have at, at the moment is that uh, they are not operating on, on a level political field. Um, you know, the government is quite rich large, and if they are, having, they are being opposed, then it's very difficult for them actually to articulate their views. Um, it doesn't quite appear that they have managed to actually get their views across to the UN Security Council because that is the main international body that can actually authorize or even officiate any serious talks towards secession. Anz de Marie Angu, let me bring you in now. Where is the international community on this? Let us say we have been quite concerned uh, at the International Crisis Group by what we have qualified as a kind of uh, measured uh, response of the international community. We think, given what happened uh, yesterday, Sunday, uh, there is a need to strengthen the and more better coordinate the response of the international community uh, since the beginning of this crisis uh, in October 2016. We have seen a government who has not been. Uh, responsive to the demands of the Anglophone, including some which are not necessarily what they qualify as terrorism, the demand for federalism, or even the demands for an effective and extended decentralization, uh, not just regarding the Anglophone regions of Cameroon, but regarding the entire nations. And we think today that uh, it is time for the international community to act uh, in a very strong way to avoid in order to avoid a possible uh, an irreversible deterioration of the situation on the ground that we are currently observe with more and more people within the secessionist trend of the Anglophone movement uh, would think that it is time for them to, to think about violent means uh, to reach their goal. Uh, Mr. Chinda, you know, the government will say that about those violent means, that the protests, uh, that the movement is a threat to national security. You know, they use the word um, extremists and terrorists. What do you make of that? Well, I think the government's qualification, the government qualifies this in the most silly terms, because Boko Haram is the real threat to national security. The Anglophone crisis has been a time bomb for a long time. And the reason for this is because the government has avoided dialogue. Extremism is seen right now by so many people because this is the, the only way some, some people could express their views. So many people try to express them peacefully by protesting. They've been shot and killed. We have elected officials who, who died yesterday from an effect of this. I mean, so, so many people have expressed their, their views and their demands through the most peaceful means possible. But they have been arrested and locked down. I mean, even writing an article on the crisis could get you in jail. So, so many people have been, been pushed to the wall and they are reacting in these extreme, extreme conditions, which we condemn. They are very wrong, but the government is supposed to create conditions for reconciliation. The first condition to reconcile with the people is for the government to release every person from prison, release the people, and call for a roundtable dialogue involving the secessionists, involving those in support of a unitary state, and those in support of federalism. And I think we can map out a good solution from this, because it's our heritage, it's our nation. And the best thing for us to do is to get back to 1961, the era when we reunited these two people, and look for the best solution for each, each Cameroonian. And the best solution for the Anglophone community is the federal system, where they could have their voices heard without Yaoundé dictating to them.
But Mr Chinder, since that hasn't happened in so many decades, um, what needs to happen now? I mean, you've talked about the, inter uh, the involvement of the international community. Is that uh, what has to happen, what could change things? That's the only solution we could, we could talk of right now, which is viable and which is reasonable. Why am I saying this? Because, first of all, we cannot expect the government of Paul Bia to mediate on this crisis, to judge this crisis, because they would come with a condition of one and indefeasible. And they, couldn't, they, they shouldn't come to the table to dialogue with preconditions. It should be a fair dialogue. It should be open. It should even be a televised dialogue for the nation to participate. And the best people or the best body should be the UN, ECOWAS, or the African Union to mediate on this crisis and have a fair and balanced view from all sides and come to a solution to ensure the nation could live in peace. Mr. Amor, what about the powers that be where you are? It is the Anglophones that have been disadvantaged. Uh, do the British still have a responsibility? Have they abandoned the Anglophones, as some see it? It is doubtful. I don't think that the British have any responsibility at the moment because um, the Anglophone Cameroon is largely a Francophone country and usually when there are cases like this, it's, it is sent to the Francophonie rather than the Commonwealth. And the Francophonie is Francophone, so the, the whole issue gets bullied. Um, and I think at the moment it would appear that uh, the Anglophone part of Cameroon have to seriously consider making their case of representations through ECOWAS escalated to, to the African Union and perhaps to the UN Security Council and then perhaps some sort of study and systematic representation uh, may get them somewhere. Uh Mr. Ongu, who do you think in the ECOWAS and the African community would support the Anglophones? Because what we saw in Western capitals in August anyway, the meetings to try and find a solution to this, um, ended either in farce or turned violent. When looking at on all the developments since one year that uh, this crisis has re-emerged, uh, I'm not sure that ECOWAS or even the African Union or Central Africa community a better place uh, to address or to play a mediation role. Uh, maybe they can, con they can accompany a kind of international community response. Even the secessionists themselves are calling much more the United Nations, uh, which is the entity that has uh, put together uh, the Cameroon Anglophone and the Cameroon Francophone in 1961. One thing I wanted uh, to come back on and to highlight is uh, emphasizing and supporting uh, what my predecessor have just said, that the crisis starting beginning was when the, the government since October were denying, was denying the existence of the Anglophone problem. Uh, further, we have seen the vag of repression and dismiss of all the Anglophone grievances to the point that when the, the government started to address to some of the what was were called technical grievances, it was too late and people were further radicalized. I think there is a need now to associate the Cameroon government with an international actor which is the most credible. And the Anglophone secessionists themselves are calling for the United Nations. Regarding the issue of the secession, of course, I think it is very unlikely that Cameroon will uh, reach that step one day. But on the issue properly of federalism or the issue of of effective and extended decentralization, I think there, is, there are things on which uh, Anglophone, Francophone and the international community can find a common ground. Uh, we at the International Crisis Group, in our last report, the August report, we advocated for an extension of an effective decentralization, which, which can be a solution at the same time good for Anglophone, but that the ground of Francophone can support, because some of the Francophone feel reluctant vis-à-vis -vis the question of federalism. And the current government, the BIA government, is having its strength in the fact that Francophone in somehow, some of them are rejecting federalism and he has his popular ground on this basis. So maybe the effective decentralization and extending it, we can discuss later about the detail of what that means, can be a kind of in-between solution uh, that can satisfy both sides uh, within this crisis. And until that happens, because there does 
seem a while away. Uh, Mr. Chinda, how worrying is the situation on the ground? Again, we've seen protesters killed. Uh, we are seeing the Committee to Protect Journalists saying that the government is using a 2014 anti-terrorism law to stifle dissent. We are once again seeing internet services cut. So where to from here right now to calm tensions before we can get to, you know, any talk of decentralization or more federalism? Well, the situation on the ground is deplorable because protesters are shot every day and so many of them are jailed and unaccounted for. So I think at this point, we really don't know what's going to be the next step in Cameroon, in the English-speaking regions. No idea if there will be more protests in the coming days or the coming months. But I think this is a moment where we have to reconcile. And we have heard the voices from the Anglophone community. I think, as uh, my predecessor just said, decentralization shouldn't be um, a topic right now, a survival solution, because since 1996, we have a constitution on decentralization. But this has not been fully implemented. I think the Anglophone community would, be, would look stupid to accept an effective decentralization at this point. What the Anglophones would prefer is what worked before. What worked before was the federal system the federal system which could ensure equality and justice for every person. Because we need to remind everyone, back in the federal days, this was two, it was two people, two states equal. And today the English community, the Anglophone community has been dissolved into little regions with little or no autonomy. And I think that's the best solution. Because if we have to keep watching what's happening on the ground, people are going to keep dying and nothing is going to happen. And at the same time, people are being pushed to the extreme. Oh, today we see a lot of bombings, and I don't think we agree that this is a good outcome of the situation. Uh, secession is not going to be the best solution because it's going to bring us into a huge humanitarian crisis. Just a couple of days, while the governor shut down the region, we saw a mass exodus of people leaving, going to a safer heaven in the Francophone region. So just imagine we have a situation of some sort of war or problem, just imagine the number of people who are going to be refugees. Imagine the number of people who are going to die. I don't think we want this situation. So the best solution right now is dialogue. And the best possible dialogue should happen on the fair table with the government of Cameroon and the secessionists and the federalists all talking to a mediator who is going to be neutral. I think the UN is going to be the best person to call upon. I hope we could listen to this call from the Anglophone community, and I hope the government could also stop the, 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 the abuse on the community. A couple of days ago, a governor called the Anglophone dogs. I mean, all of this stigmatization helps in, in pushing the secessionists towards a legitimate reason. And I think it's time for us to reconcile, but on the basis of true dialogue. Mr. On Ongu. the table, Mr. Angu, if I may bring you in here, who will represent the um, Anglophones in this true dialogue if the government was to agree to hold dialogue? They have jailed many of the most prominent representatives of the movement. I think that's a, a key question, uh, not just for us, but for the entire Cameroon. Uh, but there are still some who are outside um, the jail that the government has recently released, even if some of them have lost uh, the very heavy popular support that they used to have in the, to benefit in the past. Uh, the government is now like in the position of not having uh, credible interlocutors with whom to discuss as some are in jail, others are abroad in the US or in South Africa and other European and American countries. Uh, but we can still start to build with the federalists who have been released, who are present in Boya and other Anglophone towns. It can be, this can be a beginning of the, the solution regarding that. All right, Mr. Angu, thank you very much for that. And uh, thanks to all our guests, Hans de Marie Angu, Albert Chinder and Michael Amoa. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Elizabeth Peranum, and the whole team here, bye for now.